welcome to Candid Conversation. I'm just going over the list of questions that people sent in. Today's question, someone wanted me to cover why universalism is a false teaching. Universalism being the idea that everybody will be saved. And the reason universalism is a false teaching is because the Bible teaches against it. Um, a lot of times, I think, the way the universalists get around it is they'll say that God is a God of love and God wants everybody to be saved. And then they also, so then they assume that, well, you know, Jesus' blood atones for everybody's sins, yeah, even those who don't believe. And then the other part of it is they'll take verses that talk about hell and say, well, that's really talking about the grave. And so then the idea is there is no hell except for it. If they believe in a hell, then it's the devil and his angels that go to that hell, but not uh, any person. So, uh, addressing those things, first off, um, when it comes to God being a God of love. Love, you ever heard of tough love? You know, uh, think of your children, let's say. You have children, you don't let them do just whatever they want. You don't say, okay, yeah, you want to you wanna go to school? Go to school. You don't want to go to school? You don't have to go to school. You want to do your homework? You don't have to do your homework. So you want to just sit around, play video, video games all day, don't go to school, don't do any work, don't do any work around the house, just lie around, watch TV, play video games, um, eat junk food, uh, what, whatever you want to do, you do. See, no one does that. A loving parent, I should say, doesn't do that. I know when I was a kid, uh, you look at the kids today, and they're a lot more unruly. They, they really think, well, that's because parents don't, they don't spend the time with their kids to discipline them, to give them rules, to make sure they follow those rules, um, at least not as much as they, you, as they did when I was growing up. And the reason you give discipline and rules to your kids, I mean, you love your kids, but you want what's best for them. So God is a God of love. He doesn't want you living in sin because that's not good for you. It's not just because God doesn't want you to disobey Him. Uh, it's that the reason there are rules and the reason there is sin is because if you do what God wants you to do, you don't sin, then you please God and that's best for you. So not killing, not stealing, not committing adultery, not coveting, not lying. Those things are, uh, it's best that you obey those rules. That's not God being mean. It's just God in His love knowing that a society uh, is going to work a lot better if you obey His rules. And ultimately in heaven, our job is to the, that God's love is the currency of heaven. Our job is to, we've received God's love and then we give it out to uh, others and that brings glory to God and it has a great society there. In uh, Revelation 21, it says, When New Jerusalem comes down, there will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. Those things have passed away. Well, the reason they've passed away is because there is no sin anymore. You know, when you have sin, then you have death and sorrow and crying and pain. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. God told Adam, when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Death is introduced into this world when Adam sins, when he disobeys God, when he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, and, and you can think of death and suffering as punishments. You say, well, death, that's the end. Well, no, it's not, because if you've got, if you've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, then you have eternal life. Uh, my wife, Lana, died a year and five months ago, but she didn't really die. I mean, yeah, she, it's just she's not on the earth anymore. She's in heaven. You know, Paul talks about it, that those who have uh, believed the gospel, that are saved, he says there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that they sleep in Jesus. He doesn't say that they died. Lazarus, 
Jesus told his disciples, Lazarus is sleeping, and I'm going to go awake him out of his sleep. And or they didn't think he was dead, but that's what he was. He had to tell them, well, Lazarus is dead. But as far as God is concerned, when you're dead, you're just sleeping. And, and I'm going to go awake you out of sleep. And so, um, death may be, you could say, the ultimate punishment, but really, God has love and he has provided life for us. Uh, so death, you don't really die if you believe the gospel. Romans 5, 8 says, God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's an important thing. You see, if I, Romans 3, 22 says that uh, the righteousness of God is offered unto all but it is only upon all them that believe. The reason, one of the reasons universalism is not true is that if I don't believe, then I don't receive God's love. So Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I trust in Jesus' death, bear on resurrection as atonement for my sin, then I receive the love. I use, make the free will decision to receive the love of God that he commended toward me when Christ died for my sins. If I don't believe the gospel, then I don't receive that love. If I receive the love, I'm part of that new creature, the body of Christ, and that I will operate for eternity in Christ. I could do that now, let Christ live in me, but, um, but I still have my vile flesh, so I'll still choose to sin, at least some of the time. But in heaven, when I've got a glorified flesh, then I'm going to choose always to believe God and serve Him, letting Christ live in me. So I receive God's love, and then I'm going to give it out for all eternity. But I had to believe the gospel in order to do that. If I decide to rebel and I don't believe the gospel, well then I don't receive God's love. And if God forced me into heaven, even though I didn't believe, like what universalism would say, well then, that's not really God's love. Because you read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and it gives you the definition of God's love. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, is not easily angry, keeps no records of wrongs, believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I didn't get everything in there, but that's the basics of it. So, if I... If God forces me to be saved, if universalism is true, then God has gone against his own definition of love. Love believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But if God forces me into heaven, it's not enduring all things. It's not bearing all things. It's just forcing me to have eternal life. And that doesn't work. That's not love. So you think of, again, the illustration with your kids. You tell your kids to obey, they don't obey, you punish them. And they can continue in a state of rebellion if they want to. But if they do, it really doesn't help. It, your, your household doesn't work. I'll give you an example. There was a, a pastor up in Northern California where I used to live. And uh, he had a daughter who was addicted to illegal drugs, bad drugs. Now, he tried everything. You know, he loved his child. Uh, he taught her in the ways of God. But, you know, it's up to her as to what she's going to do. And he did everything he could for her. Uh, when she was arrested and, uh, you know, in the drugs and that, well, he put her into, a few different times, he put her into these drug rehabilitation programs. But each time, what she'd do is she'd sneak drugs in, or her friends would get the drugs in, and um, and so they kick her out of the program. Because she's ruining it. Now you say, well, the people in the program, they can't have somebody in that program who's sneaking drugs in, because it's going to ruin it for everybody else. And then, so finally, they kicked out of the program. Well, what ends up happening is the girl is now, or the woman now, is just um, living, she's homeless. She's living on the street. Now, her, her parents live in the same town, small town. They live in the same town there. 
but he has to say he has comes to the point where he has to say you're not welcome in my home anymore well he loves his daughter he wants his daughter to be with him he'll do everything he can to help her he's done everything he can to help her but she ref continues to refuse his love she continues to be in illegal drugs and uh, ruining her life and if she stays on in his house then um, then it's just gonna she's just gonna it's just gonna exacerbate the problem and you know implicate him and his wife and everybody in his household too because maybe they get charged because they're drugs in the house you know so for uh, even though he loves his daughter and wants his daughter to be with him be in his house and take care of her she keeps refusing his um, willingness to help drug rehabilitation programs you know giving her the gospel uh, giving her you know doctrine from God's Word um, and everything he can and she just refuses it all so he eventually just has to kick her out of the house or else it's going to ruin the whole house you know it puts his family in danger because when you've got drugs there or somebody who is burglarizing they get drugs and or is high so does crazy things then it's all it's going to ruin the house there's no peace in that house there's no safety no security no uh, it'll just ruin destroy the whole family so the daughter has to be kicked out even though he loves her and that's what it is with your sin see the problem with universalists is they don't realize how awful sin is i mean if so, if love is patient kind uh you know is not proud, is not rude, does not envy, does not boast, is not easily angered, keeps no records of wrongs, does not delight in evil, rejoices in the truth. You know, all those things that we mentioned God's love is. If you've got a society in heaven where there is no sin and you get to give God's love out, you've received God's love and that you believe the gospel, then you give God's love out forever uh, by living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God and uh, having Christ live in you, living by the faith of the Son of God, then you've got a perfect society with no problems. And that's what God, that's the reason God made humans in the first place, was so that God could indwell man and share his love to man and then man sharing his love to others. And so it's a community of complete, perfect love, no problems, no sin whatsoever. And so in that society, any sin would mar it. You know, that's why when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he ruined paradise. God had to kick Adam and Eve out of paradise because of one sin. All he did was eat a piece of fruit, but it was rebellion against God, and now he became his own God knowing good and evil. And so since he wouldn't listen to God, it wouldn't live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, but he's going to live by his own rules, then God has to kick him out. But God still loves him, so he provides redemption in that Jesus died for his sins. You know, just like the, the pastor who has a daughter loves her, and even though he, she rebels against him, he still provides opportunity, drug rehabilitation program, the gospel, sound doctrine, you know, all those types of things. And she still rejects it. So if you keep her around, it's going to ruin your family and your household. And if God keeps sinners around in heaven, it's going to ruin heaven. If if universalism is true, then what you've got is in heaven, it's going to be just like it is on earth. You look at all the problems here. You know why we have so many problems here? It's all because of sin. If you get rid of sin, you get rid of all the problems. So what God does is he gets rid of sin in heaven to get rid of all the problems. And all you have is a society living on love rather than money and wickedness and evil. They're living on love. That's all it is. And it's just a wonderful, eternal bliss that you can't even fathom how wonderful it's going to be uh, because we've never lived in a world like that. But the consequence of that is in order to have God's love, then you have to get rid of those who rebel. You know, God loved Lucifer. He was perfect in wisdom and beauty in the day God created him. He was a lovely creature. But then he sinned and God had to kick him out. So, he doesn't love you any more than he loves Lucifer. I mean, it was a created being. And when Lucifer sins, 
John 8 says he was a murderer from the beginning and when he speaks a lie he is the father of the lie and if God allowed sinners unbelievers to be in heaven they're gonna live by their own flesh their own lust they're not gonna live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God and they're gonna be murderers and liars and it's gonna murder or destroy God's perfect society in heaven and again if God forced you into that well then there's no free will and it's it goes against God's definition of love you can have say a factory especially nowadays with all the automation where you can have computers and things running everything you know robots putting together things and all this stuff well maybe things tasks get done you know car manufacturers have robots put together cars so maybe the car gets put together uh, but there's no love involved in that and that's fine when you're building a machine but when you're dealing with people in society that's that's no good you know, God didn't make if God just wanted to have um, not have his love but have a society that runs but just not have any love in it um, he would have created us without free will there, there wouldn't be any sin because we would be forced not to sin uh, but God all those wonderful characteristics of charity that we mentioned in 1st Corinthians 13 4 through 8 they come through only when we make the free will decision to trust in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for our sin and then we use our free will to serve God for all eternity and God's love comes through us and th uh, to us uh, throughout all eternity and it's just a wonderful beautiful thing so the, the main reason universalism is a false teaching is because if God saved everyone he would have to take away free will and that goes against love so there wouldn't be any love in heaven and so then the society would be just like basically it wouldn't be as bad as it is now because you don't have the sin and rebellion but it would be forced obedience and so it'd be like living on a, an assembly line at work you know your parts the parts get put together because the robots put them together perfectly uh, but there's no love in that um, and so what's the point in that the, the highest characteristic is love and God is love first John 4 8 says it doesn't say he's loving he is love he embodies love and so the only way God can have a vessel in which he can share his love for all eternity is if he makes man he says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? The place of his rest is a body that the spirit can indwell, God can indwell, that will share God's love perfectly throughout all eternity. And ultimately that body is the Lord Jesus Christ and us in him. So that's why universalism is false. Now, we got a few minutes left, so briefly, uh, verses about they'll say well there is no hell or hell is only for the devil and his angels and the word hell should be translated as grave very easy to refute all that stuff there are many verses we can go to that show that hell is a real place of eternal torment and that humans go there so a lot of times they'll use Matthew 25 31 the, 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 the hell is prepared for the devil and his angels well yes but in that same context the people on his left hand called the goats end up being thrown into that hell depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels so if the goats on God's left hand are going into the place prepared for the devil and his angels then they are going to eternal torment they're going to hell so the very verse that they say to, that they use to show that hell is for the devil and his angels is shows that it's also for unbelievers yes it was prepared only for the devil and his angels but it ends up having to have take in unbelievers as well the book of Isaiah says that hell hath enlarged herself mark 9 and mark 9 Jesus says that um, it's better to cut off if your right hand offend you cut you cut it off because it's better to enter into a life maimed than into uh, into hellfire um, with a, a whole body entering into hellfire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched so the fire is not quenched it's eternal the worm dieth not means you're not annihilated meaning that you always exist in a state of eternal torment in a lake of fire and he says it three different times in mark 9 around verse 43 to verse 49 um, 
talking about hell. It's a repeat of Isaiah 66, which also says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And it talks about a place where people are in hell and then people on earth in the New Jerusalem see that, or I should say in, uh, in the Jerusalem where, where the Lord Jesus Christ is reigning. And they see into hell and it's an abhorring to all flesh. So it shows it's a place of eternal torment, that uh, people are actually burning, literally burning and, and in torment, and um, the fire does not, is not quenched, so it, it lasts forever, there is no rest. Uh, the worm dieth not, meaning they never die, they're always down there in that degenerated state of a worm that, down there in hell, and they're burning and they're in torment, so much so that the people who are on earth can look down there, and it's an abhorring to them to see that eternal torment. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 says, those who take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast shall have their place uh, in eternal fire. It says they have, they shall be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and of the holy angels. They have no rest day nor night. So they're eternally tormented, no rest whatsoever. Um, and, and so you got verse after verse in the Bible that talks about hell being a place of, of uh, in eternal torment. Uh, Jesus refers to the religious leaders and says that um, they are children of the devil in John 8, 44. It says, because they are children of the devil, Matthew 23, he says, you cannot escape the damnation of hell. And then he mentions in several places in the book of Matthew that they are going to be in outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So even if you say, well, outer darkness is a different place than hell. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth, folks. Um, that's not a pleasant place. So they're just not in, you know, they're not just completely done away with like the Jehovah Witness idea and they don't exist anymore. No, they feel pain. If you're weeping, from, it's from pain. And if you're gnashing your teeth, I mean, that is, gnashing teeth is a sound that your teeth make when they clench together uh, because you're in so much pain. Um, probably none of us have experienced that much pain in in this world because uh, you got pain medication nowadays. There is no pain medication in hell. They are in such pain. They're in. They're weeping and they're gnashing their teeth. So you got those verses. You got them going to hell in Matthew twenty five. Uh, Matthew twenty five. Yeah. Uh, you've got the them being children of the devil. You got them in hell where the worm dieth not the fire is not quenched you got the eternal torment of revelation 14 9 through 11 have no rest day nor night they are in such um sad torments that they are um that they uh are in abhorring to all flesh and you got luke 16 the rich man i mean he is just in such he says i'm tormented in this flame he doesn't say, I was annihilated and I can't feel anything. I don't cease to exist, so I can't talk. He says, I'm tormented in this flame. Can you at least give me a drop of water? Some relief. Just give me some hope. And there is no hope in heaven. There is no relief. There is no rest. It's an eternal torment place. And God has to put them there because if they are on the earth, if they're in God's kingdom, then they are going to ruin it for everybody else. Only through fire is sin purged out to where their sin, which is so bad, will not affect us. And they're put away by that fire. If they're not in fire, if there's any rest, then that sin can affect God's kingdom. And so there cannot be any rest from that fire. Thanks for watching.